Dr. Dixon, Marjorie, welcome to Inside Reproductive Health. Thank you for having me. That you're based in Toronto. We've had a few Canadian REIs on the show before. Possibly most, if not all of whom, have also been from Toronto. You're the principal of a practice there called Anova, and I believe that was somewhere uh, along the timeline of, of five years ago. If I'm if I'm in the right ballpark, it, yeah, four and a half. That's right. So what was the gen, one of the things I like to do on the show is to have founders talk about why they started their practice. That's a decision in and of itself. We have a lot of younger docs that listen. And can you talk to us a little bit about even before the what of starting the practice, what led you to do it? So um, I trained a little bit, though I'm Canadian, I trained a little bit in Canada and the States. And when I came to the States, it was formal AVOG accredited training and the delivery of care and the, um, what I felt like in as much as the physician's accountability and the scientific knowledge and the technology that was involved in the care and the approach to care was, um, it felt like it was we were held to a higher standard. And then when I came back to Canada to begin my practice, and now this, I don't wanna say it out loud because I'm gonna age myself, but it was 2004. And it just felt like I was stepping back in time. We were in paper charts. There was no use of antagonists at the time. And um, I remembered that the way that I wanted to carry on practice and I had done a really busy third party practice in the States because it was regulated by the FDA and there was a clear approach and processes and procedures around it. And I felt like I was being handcuffed, like I couldn't deliver the care that I was trained to do. And then also it was a, a thing of principle because in Canada there was something called the Assisted Human Reproduction Act and it was a bit complex and, and difficult to navigate and maybe a little nebulous and physicians were leery to get involved in providing care to the LGBTQI plus of which I was a part. And out of a place of principle, I really felt like I wanted to make this difference and I wanted us to be the best and I wanted us to be held to a world-class standard and I didn't find a practice that I could practice in that provided that for patients. And so uh, I don't know that I ever had the notion of Innova right off the get-go, like uh, off the hop that it was to be the best and to provide care throughout the province and potentially Canada. But it was definitely from a place of, I wanna provide everyone with access to care and I don't want anyone to feel othered in their ability to access and build their family and grow their family. Didn't want people to be seen as different. You Not felt, go ahead. You mentioned that you felt like there, there were, uh, you felt handcuffed in, in being able to provide the, the standard of care that you had been trained to deliver. Can you give some examples? Well, I, I just felt like there were standardized protocols, how, how I trained, we referred to the literature a lot and how we um, crafted protocols for patients, our approaches to patients as well. Um, the LGBTQI plus community was seen though different as to be included. And it was a little astonishing to me to come back to Canada where some of the um, older generation of fertility providers were reluctant to allow me to practice and provide care to gay men. And they would say things to me like, oh, well, I reserve the right to not deliver. That's my, that's my guy voice. I deserve the right to not deliver care if I don't feel comfortable to deliver care. And I'm like, well, that's discriminatory actually. And everyone has a right to a family and I want to be allowed to do this. And so I endeavored to create connections with legal teams with lawyers who understood the act and what we could and could not do and and wanted to also create routes for patients to be able to get the care without feeling that they were othered or or not welcome what do you speculate the reason if you do speculate what the reasons are or maybe you you feel more strongly but i, I could speculate one old schoolness being one of it two <laughs> Canadian clinics tend to be even busier than than U.S. clinics in terms of new patients, at least, partly because in in most, if not every province, I believe the initial consult is paid for. So it's not uncommon to see uh, a clinic with several month wait list. So I could see that being one thing and say, like, well, I'm so darn busy anyway. Why worry about one more thing? The other is maybe legislation or or fourth uh, ancillary legislation, mm -hmm. that things like like 
gestational carriers and, and donor eggs. So mm-hmm. of that whole hodgepodge and perhaps others, what do you speculate the, or, or perhaps feel more strongly about the reasons for? Um, I, I think it was just comfort and approach at the time. And people really, the physicians, in fairness, the, it was some of the um, acts in providing care to communities through gestational surrogacy and egg donation was uh, quite punitive. It was covered in the Penal Code of Canada, right? So if you did any of the prohibited acts in the uh, Sister Human Reproduction Act, it was punishable by 10 years in prison or a $500,000 fine. So, you know, I understand why the clinicians and clinics were leery initially to get involved. Like there's a solution to every problem. And if you find the right legal team and you have, uh, physicians who understand what you can and cannot do in the provision of care, because you are providing care safely to gestational surrogates and egg donations, and egg donors and intended parents, and the unintended consequence of the nebulosity and the, the fearful environment that physicians lived in um, was that the patients were given barriers to access care. And I don't think it was an intentional thing. It was an unintended consequence, but there were few physicians that were willing to stick their necks out and say, you know what, this is not right. We're trained to provide care to all. And we have to find a way to create mechanisms for our patients to get safe care, right? And and that was what I think was probably the biggest barrier for patients. It was fear. It was an environment that was uncertain and, you know, you needed people to say, okay, let's create a path that is conformed to the regulations, but that protects both the intended parents and the gestational surrogates and the egg donors. From the regulatory standpoint, how much has it changed or not changed in the last decade? Okay, interesting that you say that. Because, uh, I, well, one, there are two things. One has been, look, for, for the LGBTQ community has come a long way in 10 years. I know that because I see some of my young staff, nurses, people at all levels of the business who are so open now and who just see it as normal, which it is. However, I grew up in a very heteronormative place, right? So 20 years ago, <laughs> when I started, it was seen as very different. I mean even when I was having my family through um, donor insemination, through donor sperm actually, I grew my family through a donor. And at the time it was novel-ish, starting to change in the late nineties, beginning of 2000s, I have a 15 year old IVF baby. And then you segue to now where people are openly talking about their experience, their sexual identity orientation Um, It was so different back then that it was important for me to include it in the mission statement of ANOVA that, you know, all are welcome, that it's inclusive in the provision of care, regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity, um, socioeconomic status, geography, uh, ethnic background. Like, I wanted access to care for all because it was the right thing to do. And there were so many barriers, either visible or um, biases that existed. You segue to now, most clinics have some kind of program for the LGBTQI plus community. Um, But I recognize that some of these places that are very open now were the same places that I wasn't allowed to do this stuff, right? And much as, you know, I may look youngish, I'm older. And so the younger crew were like, hasn't it always been this way? I'm like, actually, no. There has been a tremendous change. And still though, there's work to be done. Because much as when you look around and we talk about how you do infertility awareness week, Canada, US, we talk about one in, you know, one in five couples. You know, 15% of the population is infertile. But you know, the LGBTQI plus community is not infertile. They're in obligate needs of eggs and sperm and gestational surrogate. And so um, though it's come a long way, there's still things that need to change. And we can grow and evolve and learn new things, even in just how we present intake forms and literature, and how we present ourselves on our websites, and how we speak, which pronouns we use, and asking patients and our clients how they prefer to be addressed. Like all of these things are very different from the standard heteronormative place that I came from, that I grew up in. And they make a significant difference to a patient's experience in a clinic. 
And, and we see patients internationally who come from jurisdictions where they're persecuted for their sexual orientation. We see patients locally who have been even in local clinics and felt like they weren't accommodated or felt extremely othered in their experience as they passed through from intake to care in the fertility center. And you know, though we're not perfect, we are very cognizant of it and we are conscious of the need to improve in our interactions with our patients every day. I smiled at your comment about uh, some of the places now that have uh, become at least at, at least become serving the community. We're not the ones doing that 20 years ago. And I smiled because and I'm not just talking about the principle of LGBTQI community. I'm, I'm talking about more of the principle of when you see society is going a, a different direction, you better know where it's going and where you stand at where it will be 20 years from now. And I'm not saying that we can, we can predict everything. And I'm not saying that someone should go with, with society and everything, but I'm saying you should know where it goes because you're going to have to, you're going to have to either say, okay, I'm, I'm going along or, or I've got some other reason for it. And I see places all the time that are just playing catch up that are yeah. just, Oh, Oh, this is cool now, or oh, we're allowed to do this now. Uh, yeah, we've always been down. No, right. you have. No, you haven't. And so sometimes I, I, you know, I guess as I get older, I feel more open to talk about it. But mainly because I recognize that I have a voice, and Inova has a voice, and we have an ability to change the fertility landscape in Canada for our inclusivity and for providing means of access to care and for the provision of the best care and technology in an amalgam of a universally covered environment and a private pay environment. So, you know, we recognize that what we needed yesterday is not what we need today, is not what we'll need tomorrow. We evolve and we change and we push ourselves. Complacency makes all of us crazy at Anova, <laughs> driven by a crazy person, but complacency is not us. And society does evolve. And you have to have passion for what you do and passion for your patients, because otherwise, how will you connect with all the people who aren't accessing care now? There are other people probably who aren't accessing care that we haven't identified. Society is has evolved. How has the legislation kept up or not kept up in Ontario and Canada? Yes. So there, the Health Canada has just changed regulations, um, effective uh, May fourth, twenty twenty, where you know, it is now the process is much clearer. So remember before I said 2003, this is Human Reproduction Act, very nebulous. People weren't sure how to navigate it or if they were safe to provide care in it. Now there are clear guidelines, actually modeled very closely to the FDA regulations in the US. So it is much more stringent in the approach and processes and checks and balances around the evaluation and medical assessment of egg donors and gestational surrogates. And really, though onerous, the purpose of it is to protect patients um, from potential infectious disease transmission, because at the end of the day, we're physicians first, and we need to be sure that the care that we're providing is safe. And so having these additional checks and balances can give both the intended parents the peace of mind that the diligence has been done in the assessment of the egg donors and the gestational circuits that, and, and sperm donors that they're involved with, as well as those uh, who are providing gametes and uteruses to carry these gestations to know that this, the importance of what is um, their ongoing commitment and then also how that medically we have to ensure that we are being diligent and clear and thorough in the approach that everybody's kept safe. So you see this contrast in the status quo versus the vision of what you see for inclusion that's part of the the, the genesis for ANOVA, then how does it start to come actually into action, into fruition? Like how does, you, you, you see the need, yeah. but then how does, it, how does it start to manifest itself? So interesting you should ask that because we did start off by just having all of our patients into the general patient pool and then we were managing our egg donors and gestational circuits. Now we have a dedicated team that does just this because we recognized that in order to get our patients to care and to coordinate with the agencies and the lawyers and the social workers that are involved in the counseling and the physicians and the, doing the medical assessments, that it required uh, some orchestration so that we can implement the processes in a consistent way and get our patients to care in a consistent and efficient way. Because 
you know, some of the rate limiting steps are the availability of gestational surrogates or the availability of egg donors that match your, your ethnic background or that you would care to select for growth of your family. So we wanted to create a process that wouldn't impede the moving forward in an efficient way, because this is a bit of a fancy party plan, right? Like you have to make sure that you have a dedicated approach, that you have your checks and your balances, and that you do it in a way that's efficacious and as efficient as possible. And that is also an evolution. So now that we have this dedicated team, we meet twice weekly, we discuss our patients, we have obligate checkpoints out with patients, and it's been a passion project. You have to love doing this stuff. It's a lot of work, right? And for us, there's nothing more beautiful than seeing families come together that otherwise wouldn't be through the miracle of science. It's yeah. awesome. You, you have this, you have a dedicated team and process. And how does that, then how does it become fluid with the rest of the, the practice? So you are, you're treating patients who are LGBTQI plus, who yeah. in and of themselves are not a monolith. And then you have uh, other segments of the population dealing with infertility. How does, how does it all become one ANOVA? I think the, the beauty of ANOVA is that we recognize that if you don't see yourself, then you won't want to be part of something, right? And so I have been blessed with a fabulous team and operators who recognize how to do the how to get people to care in a way that brings them through what we have as our general population, but that also has special attention to the details and net needs of the community. So when we are presenting ourselves and we're talking about infertility, we make sure that we have gay couples represented, transgender individuals represented in our literature, in our social media, on our website, and all our digital media, and sometimes our print media, because people need to see themselves and feel included. And that's what I think um, the team has done really well. And also they throw me everywhere to talk about how, what our approach is and why it's so important for us to carefully consider everyone's experience from start to finish. So it's really having careful considerations from the referral minute all the way through to the assessment, to the provision of care, to the going home pregnant. Everyone is considered specially through operations, through our growth, through our nursing teams, through our embryology teams. Everybody is aware of where someone fits into the puzzle of ANOVA. And there's a process and a specific path for that. How did you build your initial team? With care. <laughs> um, it started with recognizing that, again, I've said it before, what we needed yesterday was not what we needed today is not what we need for the future. It was also um, recognizing that it's more important to find the right person for the job than to try to make a job fit a person when you recognize what you need to leverage for growth. And so, you know, having a great HR team, having people who are experienced in the industry, having a lot of really loyal core team leads within the business has been really critical to the culture and to creating ambassadors for ANOVA who are providing the care on the front lines because you know there's culture to all of this, right? What you will experience, what patients experience going into one fertility clinic might not be what they experience going to another, right? And so for us, it was very important to find people who would be part of the executive committee, who would be um, ambassadors for the business in both the amalgam of the vision, but also the business. And, and that's tricky. Headhunters, HR, careful interviews, specking people for also everyone wants to be the best. Did you have a couple of Jerry Maguire half baked people, the scenes in each of those <laughs> movies? Right? Who's coming with me, man? Did, 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 you, did you have uh, a, a couple of those from your network of, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Who's coming with me? Did, Who's coming with me? Did you have any of those folks? Uh, well, yeah, ish, I guess. I don't know. We, we have figured out how to work really hard, but to, to love what we do 
and to celebrate the, the wins and to use the losses, because we don't win all the time, but to learn from what we don't do as well and to really honestly, diligently and forthrightly strive to improve. And, and I have to say, there are some people who said like, you had me hello, right? The people <laughs> are in, Jerry yeah. Maguire reference again. But um, like, people can tell if you're genuine People can also tell if you're really dedicated and if you're not just paying lip service, right? And actions really speak louder than words, though I have a lot of words. And we at Anova do speak a lot. I have some great communicators all over. But we are really, truly, diligently endeavoring to be the best, right? And we are constantly innovating and working to improve our processes, to improve our the medicine, to continue medical education for all of the staff that's involved, onboarding training, like all of these things that, that we're doing to try to make ourselves the best place for anyone wanting to grow their family. You're, you had me at p hello point really sticks out to me because to the extent that someone can paint the vision that's what allows people to take a bigger leap and follow you. It's very hard to follow someone if the vision isn't clear and if it's not compelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, you're just getting people who are looking for a job. And then maybe you can, you know, maybe you're leveraging something else like personal reputation or, or their possibility of professional development. But I, when I think back to our first employees, some of whom are, are with us now, all right, my creative manager, my project manager, it's like, why would they have done what they both <laughs> left job, they had jobs, and they left them, right? that they were happy with and they left. Uh -huh. And I was at least able to to articulate some sort of vision. You've just articulated one that's very compelling, that's easy to recognize if that's important to you. It's easy to say, yeah. yes, that's something that I want to be a part of. And I do think it's a challenge, especially for a lot of centers that have been around since, you know, let's call it the, the mid 90s. But I, I wrote a few articles a few years ago about that I think a, a lot of practices have inherited the model of the general practice from the mid 20th century. And that just often isn't enough for millennial employees, for Gen Z employees who need something more. Right, a million percent. And, and for us, I mean, like, honestly, people believe in the vision. I think that that's how we've got some really great people. Um, and then there, I recognize how blessed we have been to have people who have left other jobs and been willing to roll up sleeves and really get in there to get to where we need to get. I acknowledge the effort. Maybe sometimes I don't say it out loud enough, but I really feel tremendous gratitude to the great people that surround ANOVA to make us look great and for us to be able to provide the care that we provide in the way that we provide to our patients. How good are you personally at celebrating wins with your team? Not how good is your team or your managers, but you uh, personally, how good are you at celebrating the wins uh, when that happens? Uh, uh, I think I'm a celebrator friend. I love the celebration. I do try to bring the fun and the um, recognition to the forefront. We have a newsletters and Friday days where we highlight something good or where someone has said something positive or, um, you know, through even our social media, right? So, so you have to meet people where they live in their community where they are. And now people communicate and access care and information through the internet. Did that just age me by calling it the internet? Through the internet and then also, you know, social media posts and websites. And, and I have crews that take the little, the positive things that we have and we post them and we share them and we share them with one another and we celebrate each other in our wins. Um, and then we have moments, a lot of moments of fun. And, and that is something that I think is critical. We created dashboards, we're showing people, you know, how many cycles we're doing, how many pregnancies we're having. Those are the things that people can hang their hats on. That's real, right? And that I, I think is, is so critical to keeping a busy clinic's morale up. And you know, COVID, hashtag crazy 2020, has provided yet another layer of 
oh my goodness, this is overwhelming and we're busy and we're trying to be safe and we're, you know, wrapped ourselves in a body condom and we're supposed to not be within this much distance and we can't touch and we can't, like, we're providing care as care providers through a computer, right? A lot of the time. And that has even made the, the celebrations of what we do well less because we can't see, touch, feel each other that much. We do have Zoom meetings. <laughs> we have Google Meets. We have, um, we've had virtual, you know, not cocktail hour, but we have virtual game time, those kinds of things, but it's just not the same. We, we need this vaccine. We need to feel better. We need to be able to see, touch, feel, squeeze each other and, you know, high five one another. And we've done a good job. That's, that's a little harder right now. I admit. That, that concept of celebrating the wins is something that I've really had to learn and, and work out because my, my natural inclination is, uh, is like, you're only as good as your last at bat. Got to get it, got to move, got to keep on moving. And, and, and so I think it's really important for principals to, to take that. It's like, no, this is important to the team. They worked hard. We landed that account. We, we had a really successful campaign that ended up getting people pregnant. I need to communicate that. And that's a lesson that, that I, I still need to work on. I think every business owner could write a book about the lessons they've learned in starting their business. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ones that stand out to you? Lessons that I've learned. Um, I think that the, the idea or ideal of, of providing for patients who otherwise may not be welcome or have access to care brings people along with you even through the toughest times because it's the right thing to do. People love to have a mission. People love to have a good reason to wake up every day, right? Like I think about it five years ago on the sixth floor of 25 Shepherd, babies weren't growing in incubators as we sit, live, breathe, do what we do. Now we've got thousands of babies, mm -hmm. right? And science is miraculous. Like just really taking a step back and recognizing what it is that we do. That has been something that I just move, go all the time. I'm hyperactive, tangential people, crazy. What has helped me is one, recognizing what we do as fabulous and remembering to remind each other that we're doing really cool, crazy stuff every day because that drives people. And then the other part is focus, 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 focus. Because you know, CEOs of tangential people, great ideas all over the place. But not every great idea needs to be chased, right? right. And the, the ability for focus on what you need for your patients as a medical director and what you need for your business as a CEO, the focus is the biggest discipline that I have learned. I, I, I concur with that. That's why I chose one. I chose one category. We just work in fertility. We don't even work with uh, other OBGYNs because yeah. at least this way, if my business ADHD fires off in a couple of different directions, at least I'm confined within one framework. You talked about the uh, the the, phys the physical location in your office. How did you choose that? And for our listeners, you're in North York. 25 years ago, that was a suburb, but now Toronto's grown so much. It's been amalgamated into the city. It's it's within the city of Toronto now it's considered a borough, but it's not it's not downtown. How did you choose that location? How did you choose like how you built it out? The choice of location was strategic. Partly was because there were no full service fertility centers in that region. So that was one. Number two, I really felt the need to serve my LGBTQI plus community. And I felt outraged that there were jurisdictions in the world where having babies was illegal for gay men. And I'm like, okay, so we gotta be near an airport. So if they wanna come to us for care, they can fly in. <laughs> and so it's off the 401, which makes it 10 minutes from the airport. Um, and then there is a significant segment of the population that doesn't love traveling downtown. Like traveling downtown gets more and more difficult and it's stressful enough to be on your fertility journey. And I just felt like it needed to be in a place where it was easy to get to, that it was easy to park around 
Um, so that was convenience. And then the other thing was scientifically, uh, it was air quality studies, looked at a bunch of different buildings, brought in the best experts from actually around the world to vet the location before I selected it. I think probably that might be one of the first times I've ever said that out loud. <laughs> but yeah, so, so much as I knew kind of the general area, it was important for convenience, the airport, be on a subway because we're on the subway system. It was important for parking, for there to be under the building, around the building, easy, easy to do and, and affordable. Um, and it was important for it to be the right place to grow babies because we know that not every IVF center is created equal and some places ability to grow embryos and make genetically normal blastocysts is less than in other groups. And we know that, but some people don't. And so it was important for, look, when you're coming up and you're gonna grow a business and you're gonna make a statement that you're gonna revolutionize your industry, you better be clear that you're gonna create a contrived path to success. That, that point about uh, the difficulty of, of, of commuting in a lot of larger cities, I do think is a challenge. I do hope that a lot of this aspect of, of telemedicine is here to stay. I think of the last CFAS that was in Toronto, I was driving back to Buffalo and it took me an hour to get from Bloor and Bathurst to the Gardner. And for listeners that, that have no idea what that means, it's about a mile or so. It's a mile or two. It took me a freaking hour. And yeah. so and I do so I do see that as a as a big issue for access to care in considering uh in, in considering locations and hopefully the 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 future of telemedicine is being here to say Marjorie, what do you see as being the future for serving the LGBTQI plus community? What, what, are this, what are the things that we're still moving in that direction that we still need to move further towards? Yeah, I think that um, having more visibility in what we provide as our, on our Instagram, Twitter, social media, websites, literature, even intake forms in our clinics, images of gay and lesbian couples, single men, dads, um, transgender individuals growing their families, singly or in couples, like different ethnicities. We have to have representation, visual representation, even some of the digital media that we're doing educationally because patients aren't necessarily now coming and sitting in front of you for you to explain how things happen. So creating some of that um, representative of all of the populations uh, is I think where we will be headed. Much less physicians explaining everything, but having digital media created that can be used and reused and accessed um, to advance care that way. And I think it's so important for people to see themselves as normal in receiving care, as opposed to, do you guys do this, right? And, and I think that that's going to be the, the very specific change in recognizing how digital media and the power of digital media um, and, and, and being very mindful in the creation of it in as much as who is the subject, right? Most of our audience is your colleagues. It's fertility doctors. It's some practice owners and, and practice managers and uh, other executives in the field, but it's mostly practice owners and mostly physicians. How would you want to conclude with to them uh, about the, the, the needs of the LGBTQI plus community in our field, but also maybe access to care at large, however you want to conclude? Um, I so believe that the universe needs us to collaborate and, and I have had a lot of experience doing this, even in providing stimulation protocols in Canada and the US for transgender individuals who are, are actually undergoing egg retrievals to provide gametes for their partners through reciprocal IVF. Okay? So people access me all the time and I'm happy to share. And I think that instead of seeing each other necessarily as competition, to unify ourselves so that we can be great in the provision of care universally. That's what I'd say. I would love us to see being able to work together and amplify one another, be multipliers of one another for the better of the community. Take ego out of the equation. 
Dr. Marjorie Dixon, thank you for taking time to come on Inside Reproductive Health. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.